going live. It's just a, we got it. You might, just going to take a second. It's uh, loading now. Okay. I'm waiting. I have YouTube up, so I'll tell you when it comes up. Okay. Uh oh, I got a problem. What? Never mind. I don't have a problem. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Oh, see, I didn't know it was a YouTube link. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> well, we got to do it in two different things. It's kind of weird. Okay. So I'm going to broadcast now. Okay. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Broadcast. Okay. But don't talk yet. Give me a second. All right. You're good, Deb. We're live? Yep. Good All right. Luck. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Deb McMullen, and I am the U46 coordinator for K-12 Science and Planetarium. Today's webinar is a model after a program started by students enrolled in environmental science at Elgin High School. The program is called the National Biodiversity Teach-In and usually runs in, in Fridays on, in February. When it was announced by Illinois governor that our schools would be closed until March 30th, our team immediately thought about the EHS model. So here we are. Before I introduce Rick's, Rick would um, allow me to explain the formative assessment accompanying this presentation. Asking questions is one of the most important science and engineering practices because it is where science begins. We no longer use the term scientific method because science is not really a step-by-step -step process. Scientists ask questions and then utilize a series of science practices to answer and or make meaning of a phenomenon. Asking questions and solving problems is the first science and engineering practice in the Next Generation Science Standards or NGSS. For this supplementary activity, we used the question formulation technique to help students generate questions for today's webinar. The QFT process can be used anywhere by anyone, not just scientists, and was developed by the Right Question Institute. We are also working on the cross-cutting concept of cause and effect. So while you're listening to Mr. Wood's presentation, we'd like you to be thinking about cause and effect. So now let me introduce to you Mr. Rick Wood. Rick is an environmental journalist who has worked, uh, whose work has taken him to the Serengeti, to the Sasashwan province in search of creatures large and small. He's an Amazon Kindle best-selling author and award, um, an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Um, at home, Rick volunteers as a marine mammal st stranding network responder, and um, he's really amazing. Um, and so now I'm going to uh, screen share with you guys his presentation, and we'll turn it over to Rick, who will tell you all about himself. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, as Deb said, uh, I'm Rick Wood, and uh, I'll be presenting today on the Southern Sea Otter Population, California. Uh, real quick, I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone who has just come together so quickly to enable this to happen, um, the, the teachers, the, the tech people, and, uh, and we'll keep this going, hopefully, and, um, and it'll be neat to continue to present to people, not only across the U.S., but, you know, certainly in different places across the world is definitely an honor. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to jump into it. So we're talking about Southern Sea Otters. And a few years ago, I did a film called Deconstructing Eden, which was a documentary about Southern Sea Otter population of Moss Land in California. And, uh, and I chose the title of the film Deconstructing Eden because it kind of goes into the heart of what we are, uh, what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so I already have one question. It says, was there any human activity that caused the sea otters range to decrease? I'm going to get to that in great, great detail, actually. Um, very shortly, if we can advance the slide, I'm going to go through my introduction real quick. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up all over the world. I was an army brat. Um, my dad served 20 years in the army, so I was born in Germany, grew up in Korea, uh, lived in many different places. I actually didn't set foot in the U.S. until I was 10. Next slide. Uh, and as an adult, I, uh, I've done a lot of different things, but most of my work has been with animals, animal rescue. I was a uh, animal control officer and rescue uh, here in Washington state. And I've been a uh, volunteer marine mammal responder working mostly with harbor seals as you see in the picture below. 
um, doing rescue as well. I have been a journalist for 15 years and uh, I've covered everything from wars to uh, politics to environmental issues. And my focus now for the past 10 years has just strictly been environmental issues. Next slide. Okay, so coming back to Southern Sea Otter, so I'm going to get into some of these questions here. Um, we're going to talk. We're going to talk very exclusively, almost, about the Southern Sea Otters in Moss Landing and Elkhorn Slough, which are kind of in the northern mid-range California on the coast, and um, and the human activity comes into play in a big way, as it'll be illustrated um, through different things that we've done to the ecosystem there, and uh, and and now how that ecosystem is recovering. And then I will also talk about how it's really still not recovering for different anthropogenic reasons. Um, one of the other questions are sea otters related to any other mammals? They certainly are, and they're in the weasel family. So uh, the Blackfoot weasel, uh, all of your weasel animals are actually cousins of the sea otter. And um, otters are in every ecosystem, whether they're sea otters or river otters, they are integral to the ecosystem there. They're what's known as a keystone species. So the words keystone species relate to how important they are to the health and maintaining the health of the uh, biological habitat that they're in. And, and we're gonna see in, you know, in further slides how that comes into play through something very special that they do. And uh, okay, we're gonna jump into a couple of ecology facts. Um, they live to be around 23 years old. They weigh, southern sea otters weigh 65 pounds. They can be four feet long. Um, it, the difference is when you think of the other main population of sea otters in the world, you're talking about the Alaskan sea otters, they can weigh up to 100 pounds and, uh, and they're you know, substantially bigger. And uh, southern sea otters have, uh, have the same fur density that they've been known for. Uh, next slide. And exactly the reason why I chose this slide is a historical picture out of California of uh, two sea otter pelts, a mother sea otter and a baby sea otter. And they were hunted to extinction. And the reason that there's a asterisk up by the words extinction is um, basically they were thought to be extinct, but there's a secret that uh, led to the rediscovery. And, um, but, but their numbers used to be in the tens of thousands in California. And they were hunted down to such a small number that in 1928, scientists accidentally discovered a single surviving raft of sea otters that numbered about 40. It's those 40 southern sea otters that are the grandparents of the 3,100 sea otters that are alive in California today. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to take a break for questions here. Uh, sea otter special ecosystem, uh, their, their fur density, by the way, is 1 million hairs per square inch. It is extremely dense. It's the reason why, even though they're mammals, they don't need blubber to live in the water. They, um, they actually can survive and, and not become hypothermic because their fur is so dense and, uh, and it keeps them from getting cold in the water. And the difference between fur of uh, the sea otter and river otters is uh, fur density. Um, you've got a lot more uh, thickness and density to the fur in sea otters, and, and you have a little bit less in, in river otters, but river otters are still very furry, and their pelts are very furry as well. Um, decreased numbers per year is hard to answer, and uh, that's because it changes, and, and those variables are things that we're going to talk about very shortly. One of the biggest variables right now are things that are being driven by climate change. And, uh, and we'll get into that. So the Southern Sea Otter skins that you see on this graphic here show you about, you know, the, the, the main period of hunting for, for sea otters really. And at a time it peaked into the tens of thousands. They were taking, that means that they were actually killing tens of thousands of sea otters um, every year. And those numbers, you know, really, really dwindled down and like I said, around the turn of the 20th century, they were thought to be extinct. The state of California actually said that they were extinct and there was a ban placed on uh, hunting sea otters at that point. 
even though they were thought to be extinct because of the uh, trapping and hunting for furs. Uh, the sea otters are still alive. And, uh, and here's, here's a, an interesting thing. It, and it's, it, this is one reason why it's important to me and it's important to a lot of people because it goes back to the fact that they're keystone species. That is to say that, that if a sea otter is absent from an ecosystem where they should be, where they used to be, that ecosystem starts to deteriorate. Can I go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is gonna show you the range. If you look about the middle of the map, you'll see San Francisco. If you go from San Francisco down to uh, San Pedro, which is down by Los Angeles, that was their main range for uh, sea otters. And today it really is their only range in California for big numbers of sea otters. Uh, Erica was asking how many sea otters die each year right now. Their mortality really jumps. Most of their deaths are attributed to great white sharks. Um, but a significant number are also attributed to people. And a lot of people don't know this, but sea otters are still poached. Um, every year we have a handful that gets shot. Um, they're, they're just hunted illegally. And, um, and these numbers do fluctuate. The numbers had been going up. In 2015, the numbers were about 3,000. And by about 2017, their numbers had jumped up to about 3,200. And now those numbers are coming down a little bit, right at about 3,100. Next slide. Again, this really shows you the area that, that I studied and that we did the film on in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary area. The part where it uh, comes in and into the inland, the, the, the part that meets with the river is an estuary. And that estuary is Elkhorn Slough and Moss Landing. And it's one of the largest uh, Southern sea otter populations in the world. About, I'd say around 200 sea otters live right there in this tiny area. Um, yeah, okay. So sea otter range used to be all up and down the Pacific coast of the US. And uh, you actually had, so I live in Washington state and right here, um, we used to have a sea otter population and uh, Puget Sound had sea otters and Oregon had sea otters and British Columbia had sea otters. And because of that trapping and hunting that just went on unchecked until the 20th century, um, the numbers of sea otters dropped not only in California where they were thought to be extinct, but they were truly functionally extinct in Washington and Oregon. And most of uh, the, the uh, what they call the lower BC inland sea area, the Salish Sea. And, uh, and what's interesting is that's actually changing. So we're starting to see a few otters are starting to come back off the coast of Washington and off the coast of British Columbia. And that's exciting, but unfortunately I haven't studied them. So I can't give you really good numbers on them. Otters do not lay eggs, they're mammals. So they give live birth and they nurse their young, but we'll talk a little bit more about the ecology when we get to what they're eating. Next slide. Okay, so 3,100 and growing. And I wouldn't say growing necessary because it does fluctuate up and down, but 3,100 is extremely awesome. So I'm gonna pause for a moment to tell you a little story. So in the late 1920s, the uh, government in California sent scientists and surveyors to look and, uh, and find a way to create a road, a highway of sorts, that went from the tip of California down to the, the bottom of California, down by San Diego. And the idea of this was to uh, create it along the coast. So for them to do this, they had to go to places that really weren't uh, being seen by people. And they did, they went down, to an area called Big Sur, which is down below Monterey. And they went surveying there and some scientists went and looked over a cliff. They just happened to look down to see uh, what was down below them. And when they looked over the cliff, they saw sea otters, which kind of tripped them out because sea otters were already thought to be extinct in California. And that's that raft of 40 survivors that I was telling you about that were hidden from people and from the activities of people and, uh, and they did the coolest thing. So the scientists decided to take action. And the way they took action is probably the neatest story I've heard in a long time. They, um, they just made no mention of it. 
they didn't tell anybody. They backed away, they put the bushes back together. They made the road go a little bit further away from that area and they waited. And some of them started talking to people in the legislature and they created laws. By the 1930s, they had laws on the books, even though they thought sea otters were extinct, they made them a protected species so they could never be hunted. And that's when the scientists, after that log got passed, the scientists came forward and said, hey guys, we have sea otters. And they started a program called translocation. So what they did is they took uh, males and females and they moved them to their traditional areas. So we're talking about Morro Bay, we're talking about uh, Moss Landing, we're talking about Santa Cruz area and uh, all around California. And they tried to see if they would make uh, a raft, uh, a new population. In, uh, <laughs> I knocked my phone down. So they tried to make a new population somewhere um, where they knew otters had been before. And it pretty much worked. And that's why we have more than 3,000 sea otters today. So from the brink of extinction, uh, the, the uh, scientists in, in their wisdom to look forward and say, we need to protect them is the whole reason why we have them today. Let me get the next slide, please. Okay, so the current threats, and this really, uh, it, well, it, it makes a lot of sense in a, in a natural history sort of way. Great white sharks are predators and they eat marine mammals. And um, so they eat sea lions, they eat, you know, they eat fish too, but they also eat, you know, other marine mammals. Sea otters are one of their menu items, um, but they're not actually eating the sea otters anymore. They're killing them. They'll grab them, they'll bite them, um, but they seem to release them. And, uh, and even though they've already killed the sea otters, uh, more than half of the time, they're not actually digesting them, they're not eating them. And that's because sea otters are really furry, like we talked about. And if you've ever you know, seen a cat who had a hairball, sharks don't really wanna have hairballs like that because they can't cough it up. Uh, the ones that do eat them are transient killer whales. These are big zorkas. They're the ones that eat mammals. So you have killer whales that only eat fish. You have other killer whales that eat mammals. And, um, and they will hunt an adult. Uh, sea otter for sure. The humans are still a threat to sea otters. Like I said, um, they're responsible for poaching. Um, they're responsible for pollution. Uh, we are responsible for introducing things into the environment that keep them uh, from being very healthy and uh, like fertilizer runoff from farms and that sort of thing. And we'll see why that creates such a big problem later. And then domestic cats, and I'm going to save that uh because i have a story to tell you later okay back to some questions here uh the range is decreasing well it, it, it it's actually now increasing a little bit but when we talk about the decrease in their range we're talking about a historical um range so they used to range from the northern tip of uh, mexican coast to all the way to alaska to the bering sea to russia and those numbers were brought down 100% due to hunting. They were hunted for their fur because their fur is so so thick. So, so, yeah, so thick. <laughs> uh, will sea otter population affect us? Yeah. Uh, the more sea otters we have in an ecosystem, the healthier the ecosystem is, the cleaner the water is, the more healthy the fish are. And uh, it really has a great telescopic effect of, uh, of good things when there's more sea otters. Uh, sea otters are very fast swimmers. They can be for short durations. They can actually get really strong bursts of speed. They can dive down to 330 feet below the water. Um, they are pretty agile in the water and they're not slow at all. Um, I, I've seen one or two as, as I was filming underwater go by me at about 20 knots. So they can actually do a really fast burst of speed. And uh, one of the questions says about weather effects. We'll talk about climate change shortly. They're two similar topics, but they're not exactly the same. And um, I'm gonna go to the next slide now. Uh, sea otters are not prone to coronavirus as far as anyone knows, but I don't think there's been a specific study on this. 
Uh, we do know that there could be some transference of different viruses to uh, marine mammals. Um, I work a lot here in Washington State with harbor seals. They actually carry most of the viruses that we carry. So the possibility exists that, that they will discover that, um, that they can be carriers, but they certainly, at this time, there's no indication that they would be spreading coronavirus. Coronavirus seems to be, a, a, at the moment, human-to-human -human transference community transmission virus and uh, that was originated from, from bats and I don't know the science on that, so I'm really not going to get too deep on on the on the questions on how the bouts develop coronavirus, but it doesn't seem to be spreading to uh, marine mammals yet. But there is a possibility, sure. So let's talk about ocean acidification, climate change. We're talking about something that started during the industrial revolution and, and the industrial Re revolution kicked off in the late 1800s and it's really had an effect on the planet so we've seen uh emissions of gases that have come out of factories and vehicles and factory farming and different you know sources that have uh, increased these uh these gases into our atmosphere and the atmosphere is that breathable layer that surrounds the earth, you know, goes up, you know, no more than, than about 200,000 feet around the planet, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not, not, not a huge layer. If you were to look at the earth as a ball, you wouldn't actually be able to see the atmosphere above the earth because it's so close to our planet. So as we introduce these glass, the, uh, the gases, uh, what they call greenhouse gases, certain things have happened. Uh, the temperatures are warming, the uh, wind cycles are changing, all these different things. And then those are the things that affect weather. And uh, it also has an effect on the oceans, which right now is uh, the main one that, that you're gonna see play out that's gonna affect sea otters and whales is ocean acidification. And this is something that uh, just basically means that the, the acidic nature of, of the water itself in the ocean is going to degrade uh, shellfish and plankton and stuff like that a lot. And it could cause a lot of problems because it could remove food sources for different animals, which do include sea otters. Um, one of the questions that just came up, sea otters for being waterproof, actually it's just water resistant. Um, they actually have to fluff themselves with a little bit of air when they come up, dry it out, trap air in there, and keep that fur above the air to insulate them as they go down underwater. Uh, they are prone to, to getting hypothermic, and so they don't stay underwater all day. In fact, they spend most of their day rafting, which is just floating on their backs. I, I had a great little stuffed animal I used to use to show this. They sit on their backs and they keep their, their paws out of the water and they keep their feet out of the water. And that actually helps to uh, thermoregulate them and it helps to, to bring in um, more heat to their bodies. And like all mammals, they're warm blooded, but they need this extra help to, to, to warm up. And then especially in Moss Landing, they're starting to go and take themselves onto the beach, which is crazy because their name and, and their scientific name is in Hydrolutris which means otters in the water. And at Moss Landing, they've started a habit, especially among the male sea otters, of actually just sunning themselves on the beach. They come out of the water and they sit on the beach, which is new and exciting and a little bit scary because it means that the world is changing. Um, next slide. Yes, sea otters can get aggressive. Um, they are prone to different diseases. Uh, rabies isn't one of their main pathogenic problems, um, but we'll talk about the ones that, that they're very prone to, like Toxoplasma gondii and Demoic acid. Uh, otters can stay, they're, they're air breathing mammals, so they could actually stay out of the water theoretically, you know, forever if they wanted to. Um, but everything they eat is in the water, so they stay in the water so that they can eat. So if we lose sea otters, what I was talking about before, they're a keystone species. They're so important to each environment. In Monterey Bay, 
Monterey Bay is beautiful today and we understand it as being this amazing blue water ecosystem with kelp beds and hundreds if not thousands of whales and sharks and otters and all this cool stuff. But back around the 1970s, 1980s, it actually wasn't. Uh, the water was, was very polluted. The biodiversity, that is to say how much different uh, species and organisms lived year round in that environment was very low uh, in comparison to what it used to be and in comparison to what it is today. And so as they translocated and they brought otters back to Moss Landing, back to Elkhorn Slough and back to Monterey Bay and back to Big Sur, uh, they started protecting by nature of how they eat things. Uh, they, they started protecting the ecosystems. Next slide. So Toxoplasma gondii, and this is something that actually is introduced into the water systems in Southern California, Central California, Northern California, from runoff, from uh, sewer outfall and, uh, and different things. And it contains cat feces. We were talking about domestic kitties, like the cat that I have. Um, these uh, Toxoplasma gondii is, is a parasitic uh, organism and it lives in cats almost exclusively, but it can be transferred to human beings. It can be transferred to sea otters. It can be transferred to all sorts of animals uh, if you come in contact with their, with their feces, with their poop. And we know you actually, if you own a cat and you use kitty litter, if you pick up the package, you'll see a warning for uh, pregnant women and people with immune issues not to handle uh, dirty kitty litter. And that's exactly because of a thing called Toxoplasma gondii. So Toxoplasma gondii is a weird, absolutely bizarre. And uh, if we can see the next slide, what it does is it gets into their brain. So it infects them and it gets in their brain and it causes them to change their behavior. And this map is an illustration of something that I went to go film. There was a uh, there was an otter that was recovered after it was killed by a great white shark. And it was killed out by the Farallon Islands, which is, uh, I'm pointing on my screen, nobody can see. <laughs> it's, it's the island that you see where the arrow is pointing at. Yeah, perfect, right there. And that's 30 miles off the coast of San Francisco. Sea otters typically don't range 30 miles just to go feed or whatever. And so the scientists looked at why did this sea otter end up way out there? And, uh, and they came to find that this sea otter was infected with the Toxoplasma gondii, which had got into its brain. And what it does is Toxoplasma gondii makes them think that they don't have to continue to do the same behaviors. So in other words, instead of just staying within a five mile radius of where they live, they start swimming, looking for food, looking for other animals further out. And this one went 30 miles out off the coast and got attacked by a great white shark. And again, the great white shark bit it and then spit it out like a big hairball. And that's why scientists were able to find it. So, uh, so basically Toxoplasma gondii is introduced by cats into the water system. And scientists started to wonder how many of the sea otters are actually infected by this. Well, in Moss Landing, they found around 80% infection rate. And it doesn't drive all of them crazy but it actually, out of the ones they tested, 80% um, of them had it. And, uh, and I think this is actually really important right now uh, because we're all living through a moment where we're talking about things like pandemic uh, viruses and, and you know scary things like that. Well, for the sea otters in a very similar way, even though 80% of them have the infection of Toxoplasma gondii within their body, uh, within their body they're not going crazy and they're not dying out in the water, but a certain percentage of them do. And scientists don't know what that percentage is yet. And they basically are uh, studying to see how much of their mortality, that means how many otters are dying each year, how much of that is something that can be attributed to Toxoplasma gondii. It's very interesting. And in the film that we did, Deconstructing Eden, we talked about it a little bit more. Toxoplasma gondii is uh, a parasite picked up by cats 
And uh, mostly it can be picked up by other animals, but mostly it's transmitted by house cats. Um, another great reason to keep house cats from roaming around outside, especially if you're around a watershed and uh, around 80% of us in the US live around a watershed, a river, a stream. Um, it's, it's another good reason to take care of the kitties and take care of the otters. Um, one of the questions say, that, that I'm looking at says, are there still human poachers that hunt otters? Yes, unfortunately there are. There are not as many. Um, in fact, you know, otters that are poached in California amount to two to five otters per year. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if there's only 3,000 of them, two to five otters is still too much. And, uh, and hopefully that can be taken care of. Uh, sea otters digestion of food, a very interesting question. They basically, they digest their food the same way the human beings do. Um, you know, they eat clams, they eat uh, crabs, they eat small fish. They eat actually, they'll choose from more than 40 different types of food. And, um, and what they do is they, they use uh, tools they're one of the few animals that we know that actually uses tools the same way humans do to break open shells of clams and mussels and eat this. And, um, and then after that, their di digestion or how they process food is very similar to ours. Um, it goes through their body and whatever's in their food ends up in their bloodstream, just like the same thing can happen to us. So uh, next slide. And I'll talk a lot about how we can help otters. There are actually a lot of things that we can do anywhere that you live that will have uh, a benefit, not only of sea otters, but other, other animals. So the parasite infection itself does have a connection to their death rates. And like I said, the scientists are studying this, but they're not exactly sure um, how many of them are dying from the Toxoplasma gondii and uh, parasite. Next slide. So I use the term superheroes when I talk about sea otters. And the reason why is, and I keep saying the words keystone species, they are one of the best keystone species known to history. <laughs> Next slide. So we're gonna have to talk about sea otters and connect them to other animals. What you see on this slide is a dead California sea lion that died from something um, that's happening more and more now because of, uh, because of climate driven uh, changes to the water. And uh, it's called a HAB, H-A-B. And uh, H-A-B is a harmful algal bloom. It's, it's where a bunch of algae, uh, instead of staying you know, in small groups you know, in the water, which they naturally, ex algae exists in the water anyway, they, uh, they start to congregate, they get all pushed together and these HABs um, can be massive. And in fact, there was a harmful algal bloom in the Gulf of Mexico back in uh, 2013 that created uh, such, such a sizable um, HAB, such a sizable algal bloom that, uh, that it covered more than 100 miles across. Uh, it's just massive. And the problem is when all the algae gets together, um, they concentrate a toxin that, that actually exists in algae anyway, called domoic acid. Next slide. So domoic acid toxicity is, uh, to sea lions especially, and seals, it's really damaging. It, uh, it can paralyze them. They can actually drown. Uh, yes, any marine mammal can drown, just like any person can drown. And, um, and it can paralyze their breathing, it can paralyze their ability to, uh, to move muscles, it can cause seizures and tremors. Next slide. And in California in 2015, I, uh, for the film, I studied the domoic acid problem, which was killing, just in Moss Landing, was killing hundreds of sea lions in a very short period of time. And this was the end result of a harmful algal bloom off the coast of California. And, uh, and it was thought to be very severe. And actually a couple of years later, we would have the same uh, type of harmful algal bloom happen again on the Pacific coast. And it actually ranged all the way from California to Washington state. 
And again, it brought with it the deaths of a lot of sea lions and seals. Now otters help with this. They can actually help to prevent harmful algal blooms from happening because they're superheroes. That's exactly what I was gonna to get to. Next slide. They can remove just an elkhorn slough, just in that little area of Moss Landing, they can remove uh, 400,000 crabs annually from that elkhorn slough. And the reason why that's helpful is those crabs, if, if they're left unchecked, they end up being you know, overpopulated and their overpopulation causes them to eat things that eat algae. And, uh, and like an orange sea slug eats algae. And if, you know, if there's too many crabs, like before the otters came back, the sea slugs were getting just eaten left and right and they couldn't keep up with eating the algae. And the, the cool thing is once the sea otters came back to Elkhorn Slough and they came back to Moss Landing, um, their appetite, the see they're superheroes because of their tummies, their appetite helped them to uh, reduce the number of crabs in Elkhorn Slough. And suddenly those harmful algal blooms, the, the, the algae with the toxicity uh, started to reduce. So the more otters that are in the water, the less likely there will be harmful algal blooms. Next slide. So they've also got a very, very profound effect on, uh, on maintaining the population of sea urchins. And, uh, and the reason this is important, so sea urchins actually eat kelp and when you think of kelp, like the big wavy strands of kelp, um, that's a very necessary thing for so many animals in their juvenile state. So when animals are younger, fish are younger, marine mammals are younger, they actually live around kelp beds to help keep them camouflaged and hidden from predators. So the kelp will actually keep them from being seen by sharks or killer whales, um, you know, other predators, big fish. And, and when the kelp is gone, those fish get eaten, they get taken out of the, the ecosystem, and it's got a very, very uh, profound effect on the health of, uh, of those areas where the kelp beds are. In Monterey Bay, the kelp beds were, were what's called decimated, uh, that is to say almost destroyed. Again, back by the 1980s, they started to realize this. And as the sea otters came back, because the sea otters love to eat sea, or, sea urchins in that area. Um, their tummies again became the superheroes and they ate enough sea urchins to where the kelp beds grew back nice and strong. And now Monterey Bay is known around the world for its beautiful kelp beds and the little juvenile animals, the little babies uh, have a place to hide and grow up. Next slide. So yeah, absolute superheroes. Um, Oh, someone just asked, how did the urchins not kill them from the inside? Uh, they actually don't eat the outside of the sea urchin. Just like they open clams, they open the inside of the sea urchin and they eat the inside meat and they leave the outside of the sea urchin, which is a spiny part that could hurt them. They leave that as garbage in the water. Well, not garbage, but, <laughs> but it's a biological waste in the water. Um, do they eat kelp? No, but they use kelp. So sea otters use certain things in their environment as tools. And I'm sure some people have heard a sea otter will actually wrap itself up in kelp, which you see on the slide in front of you here on a computer screen. They'll wrap them, their bodies up and they'll take a nap and the kelp kind of keeps them from floating away. And, uh, and they're so smart to know how to do this so that even when it gets to be a little wavy or the tide is going in and out, it won't suck them out into the ocean because they're being anchored by kelp. But what foods do they eat? They eat urchins, mussels, clams, small fish, uh, Big Macs. No, they don't eat Big Macs. No, that's not true. Um, but they do eat crabs uh, in many varieties. They eat shellfish, um, in many varieties, so not just mussels and clams and oysters and abalone and all these different things, but you know, anything that you can think of that, that has a shell can be cracked open and, and, and eaten, that's what a sea otter will eat. But they, they select from more than 40 different uh, types of animals and, uh, and creatures to eat. Next slide. 
Uh, I'm going to go back through some ecology questions because I have some, some reoccurring ones. Their lifespan is up to about 24, 23 years. And, um, and, and also that's for wild sea otters. So sea otters in captivity have a different lifespan. Um, it's slightly less. Sea otters in the wild live a little bit longer. And uh, can they attack? Sea, uh, can they attack people? <laughs> yeah, they certainly can. They're four feet long, six to five pounds, with uh, teeth bigger than dogs, and uh, and they can. Uh, a sea otter's first line of defense is to swim away, but if they feel like they're backed into a corner, they remember remember the weasel, weasel family, and weasels do fight for their territory. Uh, they can be aggressive. The uh, the toxicity of the uh the toxoplasma gondii that i was telling you about it gets in their brains makes them hyper aggressive and while filming deconstructing eden while filming the the documentary film about sea otters uh i witnessed them randomly attack other animals for no reason uh, i watched a male sea otter on his back not swimming towards it literally bump up against a seabird turn around grab it and kill it um, and that's probably from the Toxoplasma gondii making them aggressive, so they could certainly attack people. Uh, sea otters in California weigh around 65 pounds for adults. In, uh, up in Alaska, those sea otters can weigh up to 100 pounds. Their predators include sharks, killer whales, people, um, parasites, and disease. Next slide. So again, this reason I went to the next slide, for, reason I went to this slide is to show you the predators and the animals they live with. So we share their ecosystem, human beings, great white sharks, seals, sea lions, we all share their ecosystem. Some animals like seals and sea lions benefit from sea otters being there and other animals benefit from killing sea otters like humans and great white sharks. Um, it's a balance in a way because you have to have enough sea otters in an ecosystem to keep it healthy and then at the same time predators are not evil because they eat certain animals uh they got to stay alive too sharks are also important to the environment people people have choices <laughs> people don't have to hunt sea otters and they weren't hunting sea otters for meat anyway they were using their fur you guys can probably hear my birds. They're getting upset because I'm not paying attention to them. Uh, next slide, please. So you can start at home and uh, I'm just gonna move, oops, move this up here. So one of the things is uh, you can look at water usage. How we use uh, water is actually helpful to the oceans, to the rivers, uh, because, you know, the, the, the more we use of fresh water, the more fresh water has to be taken out of the natural environment. And, um, and so conserving water helps no matter where you live, because all water on the planet is interconnected. If you think about evaporation and weather cycles and climate, you know, the water in, uh, I don't know, in Florida, can evaporate and become water in Africa at a certain point or vice versa. Actually, it actually moves in the other direction from Africa, to the east coast of the United States. Um, so we're all interconnected. So water usage is very important. Uh, plastic use, this is the one every single person can do. So plastic is made out of a, out of a substance, it's created from a substance that needs a polymer. And that polymer is based on uh, petrochemicals and a petro chemical sounds weird think of it as gas like gasoline for your car the same chemicals that go in gas are what makes petrochemicals and those petrochemicals are the key component of plastics petrochemicals are carcinogenic that means they cause cancer they also cause immune deficiency they cause a lot of health problems and there's there's a reason why when you go to the gas station there's a warning on the gas pump that says not to breathe in gasoline vapors because it can cause health problems. Well, plastics get into the environment 
they get thrown on a beach, they get thrown into a river, they wash all the way hundreds, even a thousand miles from one part of a river into the ocean, they end up out there. We have so much plastic out in the ocean right now that, um, that when it starts to break down, so it never goes away, but it becomes smaller and smaller pieces. When it becomes these tiny, tiny pieces, it ends up being ingested by every animal in the marine system. So we find sea turtles that have eaten hundreds upon hundreds of pieces of plastic. We're, we're finding whales, every time a whale washes up here in Washington after it's passed away, and we go and we conduct what's called a necropsy, which is uh, like an autopsy. It's when you look at a dead, dead animal by taking it apart, um, we find plastic, every single one. And uh, so the easiest way to prevent that is to think about using plastic less and think about using plastics uh, or something other than plastics. So if you have the ability to go somewhere, instead of getting a straw in your drink, you know, you can just drink your drink without the straw, you've reduced some plastic. It's very easy. And, and, and honestly, every little bit helps because it's not just one person doing it. We have 7 billion people on the planet. If 7 billion people uh, made a conscious effort to reduce plastic, that would have a profound effect on how much plastic ended up in the marine environment and, and in the ecosystems out there. Uh, you can educate others. So you can take whatever you've learned today, you can take that information and you can bring it to your friends and have a discussion and do it factually. So we live in a time when your internet is full of all these fun videos and, and everybody's got facts. Well, some facts are better than other facts. And when, when you have your discussions, when you talk about things, if you, if you don't know the answer, there are resources to go to. So there are marine mammal centers. Um, you're talking about like the, the Marine Mammal Center in California and Sausalito has a whole website and their website has all the facts and figures that you could ever want in a discussion about sea otters because they do the research on them. Um, you know, government organizations have facts about sea otters. There's one, uh, NOAA, NOAA, uh, their website, you can look up ecology, you can look up the threats to sea otters, you can look up disease transmission in more detail than what we've talked about today. So there are a lot of great places to go to seek information. Uh, above and beyond that, you can always go to the library and do a search for books on sea otters, films like Deconstructing Eden, like my documentary. Uh, my documentary, by the way, is online for free. You don't need to buy it. You can just go watch it anytime. I'll share the link with you in a little bit. I'm gonna go back to questions. I actually minimized the questions so I could see the slide. Okay, uh, percentage of body weight, do they eat? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I do know this much because I wrote this down earlier because I kind of made an impact on me. Um, they can eat up to 75 mussels or clams per hour. Per hour. That's a lot of mussels or clams. Um, if per body weight, I would assume that they have to be taking in at least 25%. 20% of their body weight on a daily basis. Uh, if you look at 20%, so you're looking at about a fifth, if they weigh 60 some odd pounds, you're looking at about maybe about 15 pounds worth of food, 10 to 15 pounds worth of food. I don't know if that's 100% accurate though. And uh, next slide. I move on here to the plastic. This is a great illustration. I've actually seen this in person. Um, I travel a lot. I've been to Tanzania, I've been to China, I've been to Costa Rica, I've been to Tunisia, I've been to a lot of countries around the world. I, uh, after this virus pandemic is lifted, I'm actually doing work in uh, Indonesia, which is where this picture was taken. And, and the thing is, there are beaches around the world that look like this. This is what happens to our plastic garbage. And it ends up in rivers, it ends up in lakes, it ends up in streams and it ends up in the ocean, which means it ends up in animals. And if you eat animals that come from the ocean or you eat vegetables that are grown um, you know, or that are harvested from ocean resources like kelp, you're probably ingesting plastic too. So it's very important that we start to work to reduce that number greatly. Next slide. There are ways 
these are three different items that get into the environment and they're very pervasive. Uh, straws kill animals. They do, they get stuck in their windpipes. Um, they choke on them. Plastic bags get eaten by sea turtles. They choke on them. Balloons get eaten by sea turtles. They choke on them. These are things that if we are conscious about using them, we can stop how many of them get into the environment. We can reduce that number. We might not be able to stop it all, but we can certainly reduce that number. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. There's a question about color blindness. No, sea otters are not color blind as far as scientists know. Um, their spectrum of vision is not exactly the same as humans because, uh, because most species actually differ a little bit in what they see, but they're not fully color blind. Next slide. This is something that I wrote in a book called Rough Cut, and this is very important. The world doesn't need more heroes. The world needs everyone to be heroic when called upon. Look around you and there's something right in front of you that could benefit from your helping hands. You can do it and then look around you again and do it again. And this right now, during a time of pandemic, should ring very, very true for everybody. Um, we can all be the heroes. We can all do something heroic for our friends, for our neighbors, for our families. Uh, we can do things for animals. We can do it from home. That's the important part. You don't have to go out and travel to China or Tanzania and walk among the elephants to help them. You can start at home. And then later, hopefully, you can go see them because they'll be flourishing in the wild if we take care of them. Next slide. So this link at the bottom is actually the uh, link to Deconstructing Eden. Uh, it's a documentary that's about 23 minutes long on the Southern Sea Otters, award-winning one film the year in several film fests. And uh, I'm not patting myself on the back. It's a good resource uh, just for learning more. I, I would love to sit here and talk to you for hours about sea otters, and, and, and I would if I could. <laughs> um, I'm gonna look through questions, see if there's anything that I missed. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, going back through questions now, and uh, bear with me. So sea otters hold rocks and they use tools. Um, they do this in, in, okay, so the rock holding, you guys need to know this, it's really cool. Huh? They have a flap of skin, I'm gonna stand up a little bit. <laughs> so they have a flap of skin that's kind of like right here. And they will actually put a rock, a flat rock or a flat thing and keep it tucked under that flap of skin all day and swim around with it and hunt with it and everything. And they'll go, and they'll put that rock on their, on their tummy, on their chest, and they'll use the rock as a tool for them to beat open, to crack open the uh, clams and mussels and, and shells and sea urchins and get in there and eat the meat inside. And what's kind of neat in a way is um, they teach the tool use, they teach it to their young. So we've seen a sea otter, a female sea otter, who she found a uh, piece of a, a glass Coke bottle that she really liked and she kept that tucked under under her flap and she swam around with it. And then she had a, a pup, she had a baby and uh, she kept using the same tool. And the baby grew up watching this. And when the baby, which was a female, became a mother as well, they found her again because she had a tag on her. So the scientists found her again and she started using a Coke bottle too. So they're not just using flat rocks, they're using different tools uh, in, that they find in the environment that they can use to crack open these shells. Uh, one of the questions says, do otters have disabilities? Yes, it's not well studied. Um, there are certainly otters out there that are born with disabilities. Their survival rate is probably not as high and that's why we don't know about them. So if, if a sea otter is born uh, blind, for instance, um, it probably wouldn't survive long enough for anyone to know about it. And uh, because they don't, they're, they're very visual animals. Um, you know, they use all of their senses. And, uh, and, and so in this case, 
they certainly have disabilities. Um, I've seen sea otters that survived injuries. So with a missing limb, like they got part of their paw chewed off, have gone on to have good lives afterwards because they can adapt to things like that. So, so with certain disabilities, they're able to overcome it. Um, I'm actually disabled myself, I'm deaf. <laughs> and, um, and so when I film movies or, or I go out and I travel, uh, my world is completely visual. I am relying on my eyes to give me 99.9% .9 of my information. And, um, and so there's a possibility that even with any disability that, uh, that an otter, especially as smart as they are, could adapt and live a, live a great life. We're just, we don't know because we're not studying it right now. Ah, um, uh, thank you for the, for the remark. Um, so their population actually decreased and I wanna make sure this is clear. Their population decreased because they were hunted so strongly. They were hunted out of uh, numbers in the 20s of thousands, tens of thousands. They were hunted down to 40 otters in California, 40. How long can they go with, without food and water? Um, well, being mammals, uh, water is a, is a key thing for them. Uh, they extract a lot of their, their fresh water from what they eat. So they do, in a digestive way, there is a difference um, as far as how they receive water. They're not going to the water fountain and getting a cup of water. They are uh, able to extract their their uh, hydration actually comes from, from what they're eating. So, uh, but they don't drink seawater. Um, they get it from the food, from, from the properties in the food that would hydrate them. Um, their survival would depend just like people. Uh, so with human beings, you have what's called the rule of three. You have three hours, three days, three weeks, uh, three hours to find shelter before hypothermia sets in, three days to find water until you die of dehydration, and three weeks to find food if you're starving. I would say it's got to be very similar for otters, um, maybe a little bit longer because they can process their uh, their system is smaller, their metabolism is higher, and they may be able to process it differently. How much time do they spend hunting? Uh, typically, a sea otter is going to spend at least half of their waking hours hunting. They spend a lot of time relaxing. Um, it's most common to see them just floating around on their backs, and that's because they have to make sure that they don't get hypothermic, because even though they have 1 million squares, uh, 1 million hairs of fur per square inch. They have all that fur. They can still actually get really cold being in the water. Uh, poachers right now, so back when they were poached on a regular basis, they were taking their fur. The poachers now just want to kill them. And there's two main reasons this is happening. One is because people see otters as a threat to the fishing industry which isn't exactly true. In fact, otters help the fishing industry by making sure that kelp beds are healthy. They make sure that little fish grow up to be big fish, which means that we get more fish. But the thought is that they eat too much and they harm the fisheries. Um, the other reason that people are poaching now is they just don't like them. Um, I know it sounds weird. To me, a sea otter is one of the, the cutest, cuddliest animals in the world. I was actually kayaking one time during the filming process. I was on a kayak and an otter came right beside me. And when it saw my kayak, it decided to crawl over the front of it and lay down. <laughs> so I had this four foot long sea otter across the front of my kayak for like 10 minutes. And the whole time I'm going, please go away, please go away. <laughs> because they're very big, their teeth are very big. And I know even though they're cute and cuddly looking, they can hurt people or if I scare it, you know, it could hurt itself trying to get off of the, the kayak. Um, but there are people out there that don't like them. And, well, okay, uh, female sea otter and a male sea otter. I, I've heard, so the babies are pups. That's for any gender. Um, and males, I've heard people refer to them as bulls like a bull, like a cow bull. Um, 
I don't know. I just call them males and females. <laughs> Most scientists I know call them males and females. I, I would find it weird to call a female sea otter a cow. It would just be weird. So the question is, could, could there be animals causing the home range to decrease? Yeah, humans. Um, we build up on the shoreline. We've built, and even in Moss Landing where I did the film, they, the sea otters live surrounded by people. They live surrounded by farmland. Um, that really decreases their range because, you know, sea otters need a healthy environment with mussels and clams and crabs and all the 40 different types of food that they eat um, to be in abundance for them to grow. And, and the water needs to be healthy. And when you have things like farmland, you have uh, pesticides that are sprayed to protect the vegetables from insects are washed off into the estuary. They're washed off into the water and, uh, and it causes problems. It causes, you know, there to be a lot of issues. So one of the reasons the, the algae started to, to grow in Elkhorn Slough was because the, uh, the, the fertilizer runoff from the farms, which are on either side of the slough, caused there to be more nitrates in the water. And nitrates are like food for algae. And the more nitrates you have, the more algae grows. And, um, and so, you know, they, they struggle with that still. Uh, is there a way to increase their home range? Well, the only way to increase their home range is to decrease the impacts that stop them from expanding. So like I was just talking about, um, healthy water, less human interference, you know, even, even tourism to some degree. When you talk about all the boats in Moss Landing, yeah, I, if you've ever heard, uh, so sound travels underwater. And, uh, and when you hear sound underwater, you know, it, it's like hearing sound above the water in a way. And when you think about boats, they have motors and engines, and you can hear this underwater. And there are literally a thousand boats between Moss Landing and Elkhorn Slough. And from big boats, fishing boats, and little private boats, and so yeah, they live. They live in a noisy environment, and I'm sure that that causes a certain amount of stress. We see this in killer whales. Actually, scientists have measured the stress level when there's more uh, sea and ocean traffic with ships. Their stress level goes up. The more stress they have, the less productive they are as far as hunting and uh, and mating and taking care of their young. So it has a uh, an effect on them. Is there, do, 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 how long can I go without food or water? Yeah, I, there's not a hard answer on that um, that I know of. Um, but just using the human body as an example, it would be a matter of days that it could survive without water. And it would be no more than a couple of weeks that it could survive without food. Otters stay awake even when they're rafting. They're not actually 100% asleep. They're, they're kind of daydreaming <laughs> um, they're very aware when they're on their backs and you see them floating by in the daytime i would say they sleep probably like we do during the nighttime hours the most being visual creatures and visual hunters they uh they are probably a lot less successful looking for food in the middle of the night and uh so probably you know around eight eight hours nine hours ten hours a day they sleep a uh, sea otter would make a horrible pet number one it wouldn't be happy. The sea otters like to be in groups. Uh, so unless you're willing to own like 80 or 100 sea otters and have the room for them, which would mean, you know, 150 miles worth of land and water, it probably not gonna be a happy animal. Um, the other thing is they're four feet long, they weigh more than 60 pounds and they can bite through a bone. So if your sea otter pet gets mad at you, it can really hurt you. Is there any more questions before I wrap this up? Are there any more slides, Deb? You were amazing. Thank you so much, Mr. Wood. Um, and I, you can't see this on the on the feed for YouTube, but lots of people just sending so much appreciation for your time. Um, and we're just so grateful. This made a huge difference. Um, for a lot of us that have been stuck at home for a while and probably, you know, stuck at home for a little while longer. Um, so thank you so much. Well, thank, thank, thank all of you for having me. I really enjoyed this. Um, 
I, I'm making myself available during this time that we're all kind of shut indoors. Uh, hopefully we can do this again, different species. I would love to do uh, seal pups, you know, harbor seals are my thing right now. Uh, orcas for sure, sea turtles, you know, just keep me in mind, I'll be here. Oh, we will, we will definitely do that. We'll take you up on it because a lot of students just really, really enjoyed this. So thanks so much. And um, by the way, we I'm, do gonna, I'm gonna type the name of my movie down here. Sure. Deconstructing. I will put your movie, um, uh, I'll add your movie to the Google Sheet. So students, if you want the, I'll send the link, I'll put it on the assignment, the original assignment. I'll put that on there for you. We'll also put it on our Facebook page. So you science and planetarium. Um, and then um, we'll also make sure that you guys can get um, access to the, to the movie um, on our homework page. So thanks for making learning so much fun. Very awesome. Thank you guys for having me. Everybody take care. We'll get through this together. Thank you. Bye, Bye. guys.